Thank you, Jeannie. What I'm going to do is going to sound very familiar and very uh, similar to some of what you heard yesterday. Uh, I'm going to take a walk back before taking a walk forward, and hopefully this will pull some of the general themes together and help us get to where Jeannie wants to go in terms of the future, because I think that's important. So uh, if we could do the first slide here, uh, my uh, remarks this morning are going to talk very much about collective responsibility and how important that is and where it's embedded in terms of the international community. Uh, at the beginning of the century, the Millennium Declaration unanimously recognized our collective responsibility to uphold certain principles. And obviously, the sentiment is very much noble, but it's also pragmatic. So what I'm going to talk about is where does this collective responsibility come from? How can we fulfill it? And why is it so important to do it now more than ever? Although this isn't going to be a surprise given the last couple of days we've spent together. So when we're talking about where it comes from, and the Millennium De Declaration itself talked about fundamental values. They are essential to international relations. There are two of these values that are especially important to understanding this collective duty. One is solidarity, and this is something that Bruno touched on briefly yesterday, and the second is shared responsibility, and I'll talk extensively about that. For the purposes of the discussion this morning, when we talk about solidarity, we're describing a principle that those who suffer or benefit least deserve help from those who benefit most. And it challenges us to manage these global problems in a way that distributes the costs and the benefits in a way that means uh, it's fair. It means pulling our own weight uh, by supporting countries who benefit us when they confront and they address forced displacement. Solidarity is most important in relation to global issues. We know that the UN Charter talks about international problems of an economic, social, cultural, or humanitarian character because these problems can predictably spill across international borders. And since these issues have shared causes or consequences, responsibility for managing them should be shared as well. Now, I really appreciated yesterday uh, Alexandra talking a lot about internal displacement because in terms of what we're talking about, there are very much parallels between the two. When we talk about forced dis displacement, <clears throat> it's one issue that, of course, crosses national boundaries. This is why, as we heard from Karen yesterday, 193 countries came together and proclaimed in last year's New York Declaration that we have a shared responsibility to manage large movements of refugees and migrants in a way that's humane, that's sensitive, that's compassionate, and that it's people-centered. To be clear, international law offers a number of other sources much older than these two declarations, that describe a duty to cooperate and address forced displacement in a way that's fair and effective. The UN Charter, for example, the uh, UNHCR statute, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, the Refugee Convention, we heard about that yesterday, UNGA resolutions, for example, and other international refugee and human rights instruments. How states implement their collective responsibility in practice is also important. We see main weaknesses of these concepts as follows. They're ambiguous. They lack an immediate enforcement mechanism. And I particularly appreciated the question about whether or not there was a law that we could ha hold states accountable. Obviously, that's difficult. As Karen mentioned, they're non-binding. binding. And I'm sure we can point, point to countless examples of when one country arguably did not fulfill and fully cooperate with its partners or support a neighbor who struggled to cope with displacement. This is why my agency, the UN Refugee Agency, places so much value on maintaining open lines of communication with states, even and perhaps especially those who shirk their responsibilities. Persuasion, including through humanitarian diplomacy, is often our most potent tool for achieving real results for those that we serve. Given the nature of this responsibility, the fact that it is tested sometimes really shouldn't surprise us. On the contrary, it's notable that these principles have actually persisted for over 70 years, despite the threats and the uneven implementation over time. Despite short-sighted political gains and other perverse incentives that tempt us to shrink from the challenge, that the wor world continues to value solidarity enough to reaffirm it time and time again. And to understand why, we have to look back a little bit about how these values evolved in the first place. 
international cooperation to benefit refugees in the form of international and intergovernmental institutions first emerged after World War I at a time of the breakup of multinational empires, wars, famine in Europe and the Middle East that killed tens of millions of people and displaced millions more. Let's see if this works. There we go. Determined that this devastating conflict would be the war to end all wars, nations coalesced to create the League of Nations, to promote international cooperation and to achieve international peace and security. The League of Nations appointed uh, Fridjof Nansen as its first High Commissioner for Refugees to deal with the million and a half Russians who were fleeing from the 1917 revolution. It soon became clear that the temporary office was bound to become more permanent as conflict-driven population movements heightened interstate tensions and threatened state security. Despite initial successes, the League of Nations proved unable to prevent a breakdown in cooperation among member states who retreated to traditional systems of defensive alliances and power blocks. Before long, the war to end all wars was followed by a war that would eventually escalate into the deadliest conflict in human history. And many of the speakers yesterday referenced this. In the aftermath, there we go, I need to press the button harder. In the aftermath of this second world war, tens of millions of people were displaced throughout Europe. The devastation from the conflict was made worse by significant levels of displacement. The world responded by attempting to formalize a more robust system of international cooperation. This time, the, under the auspices of the United Nations, dedicated to respect for human rights. <clears throat> Through this new institution, a diverse group of nations drew from their respective legal, religious, philosophical, and cultural traditions to give shape to this new commitment and agree upon common rules to protect everyone. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a remarkable statement of collective responsibility, proclaiming that every individual, every organ of society, shall strive to make this protection universal and effective. And this document made clear that human rights provide an essential foundation for peace to endure between nations. Soon thereafter, the world moved quickly to act upon the Declaration's call to protect those through progressive measures, domestic and international, my office with the High Commissioner for, for Refugees was founded in 1950. Soon thereafter, there was the 1951 Refugee Convention. This is the bedrock of international protection. And the convention also confirms the importance of international cooperations. Now, the, there are a couple of things in the preamble that explain shared responsibility even back to 1951. One, protecting international uh, individual rights, excuse me, individual rights. And two, minimizing interstate tension. Shared responsibility explains post-war efforts to catalyze co cooperation in post-war Europe. The United States understood well that military cooperation was insufficient if not coupled with other forms of solidarity. We know that the Marshall Plan injected massive resources into reconstructing economies devastated by the war and a European push for regional unity helped secure peace through economic and political cooperation. This has contributed to unmistakable peace and prosperity in the world. So we can see why the concept of collective responsibility persists, and the world learned the hard way that without solidarity, states will race to pursue policies that benefit, benefit their short-term interests with no regard for the costs, no matter how horrifying inflicted on others. Collective responsibility is not just legal, as the New York Declaration reminds us that one challenge is above all moral and humanitarian. Given what is happening in the world today, this aspect of collective responsibility is self-evident. We've talked a lot about the, the big crisis we are in terms of displacement in the world. Here is a slightly different graph from my colleagues yesterday. Uh, 65 million, the combined population of California and Texas forced to flee but from persecution, war, and other threats to fundamental rights, half of these 65 people, 65 million people, are kids. <laughs> the longer term trends are equally alarming. We know that forced displacement has risen, risen sharply since 2011. It's doubled in the last two decades, and it affects a higher percentage of the world population than at any time in the last few decades. Perhaps, from our perspective, the most troubling aspect of this crisis is the lack of solutions for these people. Most importantly, the inability of governments to come together and find, as Maha said yesterday, just political solutions to displacement. 
And at an individual level of all the refugees in 2015, barely 1% were able to return home in safety and dignity. Just 0.2% were able to be naturalized in their places of first asylum. And less than 1% were resettled to third countries, like the United States. With the remaining 98% in an uncertain limbo, with no end to the reasons for flight, we can expect that this crisis, unfortunately, will worsen. The need for shared responsibility is all the more apparent when we look at where people flee. And I'm going to show you a very familiar map. I think you saw it yesterday. <laughs> more than half of the refugees are from three countries, Sudan, uh, excuse me, Syria, Afghanistan, and Somalia. But there are other large populations of Sudanese, South Sudanese, Colombians, Congolese, Iraqis, Nigerians, and others. The vast majority of refugees, as was also mentioned, live in low to middle income countries. And these countries are struggling to provide for basic infrastructure to serve their own citizens, not to mention their new residents. And while hosting refugees can come at a heavy cost in the short term, they open their borders to them and they do their best to meet their needs. These countries are pro providing a global public good and allow access to national systems of education and healthcare, job markets to some of the world's most vulnerable people, and they do this despite their own limited resources. The open question remains, however, whether the rest of the world will step up fully to share this responsibility. As an institution, UNHCR and its nearly 1,000 partners represents the world's commitment to its collective responsibility to address and find solutions for displacement. The vast majority of our funds are voluntary contributions, not assessed. We, they support operations in 128 different countries, over 450 uh, field locations. We have 90% of our team that are in the field as opposed to headquarters locations. 50% of that team is in hardship locations, difficult areas. We're operating in 26 countries with active emergency operations currently. On the front lines of these crises, we with partners, and I want to emphasize this, we do not do this alone, deliver life-saving aid like shelter, food, water, we help safeguard basic rights, we develop solutions that allow people to regain some control over their lives. This role is necessarily palliative because the long-term resolution of refugee crises depends on circumstances that only states can provide, such as the political will to end an armed conflict. Our priorities are also unfortunately limited by persistent funding gaps, as was mentioned yesterday, because we're working with roughly half of the resources that we need to meet those needs. We also work to align our efforts with the longer term needs of refugees and the communities that receive them. And where possible, we try to build up local systems rather than create separate parallel systems of support. These sorts of projects in particular represent the world's efforts to fulfill the shared responsibility that was described in the New York Declaration. For example, in Greece, we helped to provide the government the capacity to process asylum claims. In Afghanistan, we provide cash grants to returnees to provide some degree of stability as they seek to rebuild their lives. In Jordan, we're working with the Family Protection Department to better serve children and survivors of sexual violence. In Turkey, we strengthen education systems that in turn accommodate refugee kids. Our work in northern Uganda, where arable land is scarce, supports local infrastructure, like schools and hospitals and fragile governorates. And these systems are important because these countries who deal with the immediate consequences of displacement are the best defense against further instability. This is especially true in regions, as we heard yesterday, where armed groups such as the Taliban and Al-Shabaab feed on such instability to recruit new members, sometimes by force from among the most vulnerable in society. The world's efforts to combat such vulnerability is key to combating extremism. As King Abdullah II of Jordan said last year, if regional refugee hosts are abandoned and left to fail, the needs won't disappear. The crisis will simply spread further, prolonging the time it takes to end this ordeal. Through multilateral institutions like the UN and its partners, governments can work collectively to do what they cannot achieve on their own. 
It was the UN and its partners on the receiving end to aid and, pro and protection for two million people who fled Rwanda in the aftermath of the 1994 genocide. Again in 1999, the UN was in the former Yugoslavia to help implement a peace agreement in the eventual return of over one million refugees. More recently, the Security Council supported African regional institutions, ECOWAS, and the African Union in pressuring the Gambia's autocratic former president, Jamey, to recognize his recent election loss. These examples reveal how collective action can leverage access and power that unilateral action cannot. Collective action is also absolutely essential because the causes of forced displacement are diverse and interrelated. While armed conflict and persecution are prominent on this list, they emerge from a complex web of problems in countries and regions of origin. And again, this is the parallel to what Alex noted yesterday. Poor governance, exclusionary politics, poverty, natural disasters, environmental factors like climate change. Repeated cycles of conflict and violence are also fueled by economies of resource extraction and the global arms trade. Statelessness and human trafficking are also both causes as well as consequences of forced displacement. These root causes represent obstacles to the human rights described in the Universal Declaration. That's why the New York Declaration links them to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The agenda and its goals are designed to address those very forces that threaten to displace even more people from their homes in the future. It is, in this sense, the most comprehensive long-term vision for our collective responsibility that we have today. To meet these goals, multilateral efforts are clearly not enough. We need to recognize all the factors that affect national development prospects and people's access in their country of asylum or origin. This is the sort of whole of society approach that the Universal Declaration challenged us to achieve. And we talked a lot yesterday about the New York Declaration, but maybe more concretely, let me tell you about the comprehensive refugee response, which is what we're putting to action now to get to Jeannie's question about being impatient for 2018 in places like Uganda and Tanzania, Somalia, and potentially others. It's up to us to try with partners to come together to show host countries how we as an international community can actually respond to large scale movements of refugees. And hopefully this will then result in the global compact that Karen described yesterday to be adopted in 2018. This could truly transform the way that we protect and aid people. First and foremost, the framework will translate into practical ways. It makes clear that development, excuse me, displacement is not just a humanitarian issue, it's also a development issue. That we're involving refugees, but also host communities. Restoring resilience, dignity, requires long-term planning for solutions from the very onset of an emergency, not just the humanitarian band-aid as soon as one flees, particularly given its protracted nature. It outlines, outlines the respective contributions of countries of origin, host countries, the international support required for the common effort. Failing our collective responsibility imposes dangerous costs on future generations. We can see this most directly in situations of humanitarian catastrophe where unilateral action fails. Here, collective action is required to unlock solutions. So let's go back to the conflict in Kosovo for, for a concrete example. This is the Macedonia-Kosovo border, and there were some 65,000 people that were trapped there at one point in 1999. Kosovo Albanians were coming across in large numbers, and Macedonia was conserved, concerned about the potentially destabilizing effect of these people in light of the existing tensions already present with regard to their own ethnic Albanian population. To ensure the continued admission of refugees on Macedonian soil, 28 countries, including the United States, came together, agreed to accept refugees uh, from Macedonia into a humanitarian a resettlement program that ultimately benefited 100,000 people. I was in Albania that same year as NATO engaged with bilateral and multilateral support of many nations. The important con uh, combination of political, military, and humanitarian contributions in solidarity with the government of Albania, there was collective support for the return of over one million people in the course of a few weeks. Resettlement of thousands more 
and protection and aid for those that remained without a solution to their displacement. Imperfect as the Kosovo example is in many other ways, it certainly shows how international solidarity can open borders and save lives. In contrast, let's consider the dangerous, though unintended, effects of closed borders that they can have on states' control over their own territory. This is a complicated map, but I'll walk a little bit through it. Smuggling networks from Africa to Europe provide a useful example. Starting around 2013, there was a dramatic spike in irregular, irregular arrivals in Europe by Eritreans and Somalis. This could not be traced to any obvious changes in their countries of origin that would have compelled greater numbers to move. It was not their reasons for flight that had changed, but rather the opportunities to move. When the Syrian conflict erupted, massive numbers of refugees began to seek safety abroad, particularly in countries neighboring Syria. Then the contract, conflict dragged on. As we heard from Maha yesterday, refugee savings dwindled. There was shortfall in support for host countries. Humanitarian aid was not sufficient to meet their needs. And people moved in large scale numbers to Europe and elsewhere. Border restrictions, many were, were forced to result to the smuggling networks in the eastern and southeastern Mediterranean. Previously, ad hoc networks began to professionalize. As the smuggling trade ballooned, Margaret grew highly responsive to changing policies of European states. Prices and routes quickly adapted to security measures and resettlement policies. And while individual European states spent significant resources policing closed borders, criminal networks have enriched themselves by merely rerouting refugees and migrants to the next border crossing. There were indications that this trade resembles transnational organized crime, complete with its complex economies, sometimes embedded in state structures, to protect lucrative profits. This comes at an enormous cost to individuals, to states, to the world. It goes well beyond humanitarian or development concerns, but indeed strikes directly at security, stability, and economic interests. It remains to be seen whether or not we look back at these events as analogous to the beginnings of a transnational criminal organizations that threaten locations like North Africa and Central America. So now we get back to shared responsibility. We, sh we note that the absence of shared responsibility for displacement can allow one problem to multiply, and therefore it's fundamentally inaccurate to discuss solidarity solely in terms of charity, as if the main question regards only whether or not we can afford to offer aid to other countries. The question really is whether can we afford not to? Can we afford to let displacement fester and morph into something more sinister and dangerous? At the beginning of my remarks, I quoted the Millennium De Declaration. What I didn't mention before was how it explicitly separates the collective responsibility as something that's in addition to leaders' responsibilities to their individual societies. Collective responsibility is more than uncertain obligation to help others. It's a moral imperative to address how our choices have contributed to harming innocent people and to not stand by while immeasurable deprivation is imposed on others. But it's more than humanitarian because it also helps our own long-term interests in stability and human rights. Our collective responsibility thus appeals to our moral sense and to our selfish concerns for our own security and safety if we take the long view. And propelled by these interests, I am hopeful that this ideal will endure because solidarity is more than sentimental, it's strategic. Thank you very much.